No pressure at all. <laughs> Thanks very much, Ruth, and thank you everyone who is here today. Uh, just to note, you can click a live transcript at the bottom for your closed captions for anyone who needs them. Um, so yeah, just to introduce myself, I'm Chandrika Narayanan Mohan. I'm a writer. I've been an arts manager for over 10 years, um, working in fundraising, marketing, strategic advising for uh, arts organizations. And I'm also a non-EU citizen, meaning I'm not an Irish citizen, and that all these things have come into play um, in terms of the practical implementations of, of other people's uh, inclusion policies. So I have, I have seen the, I've been on the receiving end of many of these things. It's gonna be really interesting to hear everyone's thoughts today. So in this seminar, um, I look forward to hearing about the work being done regarding diversity and inclusion with a focus on accountability, transparency, actionable change and impact evaluation. And I suppose just to set the tone for this meeting, um, it's great to hear about everyone's policies, but I'm hoping for, a very candid, honest conversation about the actual challenges of implementing these things and the hurdles that people actually run into when they find that their internal structure or their institutional structure actually goes against the things they're trying to achieve with these policies, because I think that's how we're actually going to implement a lot of these things and it'll be very helpful to the people in this room and elsewhere um, to actually figure out well, how is it done and what challenges are you facing, how can that help us overcome our challenges. Um, so we're very excited to uh, have with us uh, Grania Tool and Nidhi Zakari Epi from Steam Press, um, Anna Walsh and James Hudson, Anna Walsh and James Hudson from the Trans Writers Union and Small Trans Library, Nevo O'Donnell and Elizabeth Mohan from Poetry Ireland, and Sasha Deboil from Kirch. I'm going to start very briefly though with Nolene Hartigan, who's going to give a small presentation, just a few slides about. I guess the context of where this all sits so everyone kind of understands why this is being done why is this being done now and what else is being done in the background by words ireland and how this fits in uh over to you nolene thank you so much chandrika um i'm probably the most boring person today so i'll keep it really fast so as as ruth mentioned this project sits it's a, a year-long project for words ireland it's likely to grow beyond this it's the first time that all seven organizations work collaboratively in this area so as an entity um and there are three different elements so four if you include this webinar series which is us having a live chat and saying showing how far we've got or showing our thinking and really getting um, expert advice from others in starting the conversation. But the, the three core elements outside of the webinars are obviously the research and the charter, which many of you will have seen, and we're still taking comments on the charter right up until the last webinar, November 30th. And this middle bit, and I suppose this is kind of the homework that I've been doing in the background with the Seven Words Ireland organisations, and I wanted to share it really briefly with you today. So what we did as part of this was, given that the seven organizations in Words Ireland are vastly different in terms of their mandate and their reach, their raison d'etre, we wanted to come up with not a one size fits all, but a way of reflecting on your organization and health checking it, if you like. I'm hoping that obviously this, it, the framework is a, is a document that was written just for the Seven Words Ireland organisations, but the checklist that we've created, we're very happy to share with people if it's useful and have people critique that or we'll certainly be uh, improving it on the basis of today. I would imagine this framework, uh, which as I say we're using internally, will be superseded by the Arts Council's toolkit on diversity and quality and inclusion, which we're expecting by the end of the year. And obviously it is supplemented by simple things like employment rights law and the new products that we see coming down the road in terms of dignity of the workplace from the Irish Theatre Institute and others. But just briefly, um, here are some of the questions that we have asked of ourselves. So we created this framework. I devised it based on literature and practice that I was hearing throughout Ireland and the UK and reflecting with Words Ireland organisations. And we came up with nine different lenses through which to view your organization when thinking about diversity and inclusion. Uh, nine's a useful number, so nine grounds plus one. Um, we started on values, and if you were with us for the webinar on the draft charter for inclusion, um, we have set out our values statements collectively 
in terms of the human right to participate in culture. Because it is there as a framework that is unimpeachable for those of us who ascribe to the human rights framework, it's something that the Irish state has signed up to, but it also values a lot of the things that we collectively value. So the right to participate in culture, the right to have your culture recognized, the right um, to be remunerated as an artist and to be heard, um, and that those rights transcend any identity issues. So we felt that that was a useful place for us to start. But then we also looked at governance, HR and operations, staff and board capacity building, data collection, programs with artists, programs for audiences, impact measurement and communications. And so it's sometimes we can fall into the to the thinking, I would say the trap, the thinking of saying, well, diversity and inclusion is all about the <coughs> poets and writers and illustrators that we publish or we promote or we program. And I suppose this framework is our attempt to say, yes, it is, absolutely. But it's also about all the other places that organizationally we hold power by virtue of receiving funding, by virtue of being in roles, by virtue of having a salary, by virtue of being on an editorial board, by virtue of being a governor of an organization. So it's our way of checking where we hold power and how we might examine that power, uh, not just that we are hopefully programming more diverse artists, but actually we're thinking about who we are. So I'm going to fly through these guys. Um, in terms of governance, some of the questions that we've asked ourselves is, has the board of the organization actually had an active debate about diversity and inclusion? Has the board looked at, its, at the diversity of its own members and taken action about that? Has the board formally adopted a strategy? Has it been published? Is it clear who's responsible for what? Does the strategy have an associated budget? Does the board have a handbook to, uh, that includes policy on how to ensure that all voices within the board and the wider organization are included? So you see littered throughout our framework, we talk about it's not just um, that old adage, diversity has been invited to the party and inclusion has been asked to dance is where are we checking that as our organizations hopefully become more diverse in their makeup, that people are actually being heard when they come, when they come with all of their different identities and when people come with different experiences, are we actually listening? Are we becoming more inclusive in our practice? Um, in the human resources uh, tick box, if you like, we looked at things like, are we, are we compliant with existing legislation on workers' rights? You know, let's look at getting our own house in order first. Are we proactive in addressing complaints of bullying, harassment, sexual harassment? That obviously has become even more pressing in the light of the work published by the Irish Theatre Institute. Have we undertaken an audit of our building, the venues we use and the communication tools that we employ to ensure that we're maximizing on accessibility? Capacity building. Do we understand the knowledge and skills that our board and staff are going to need in order to be more responsive on diversity and inclusion issues? Have we identified appropriate supports for them? Um, we looked in particular at the whole issue of there is, and I'm seeing it across projects outside of Words Ireland, a rush to, if we do unconscious bias training or if we do anti-racism training, we're done. I'm going, well, training has never worked uh, out of context ever. And in fact, what the literature would suggest is if people are told to do training on diversity and inclusion, you can actually get the opposite effect. You can get people getting very defensive. Um, and so, but there is a value to training and capacity building. For me, the most interesting aspect of capacity building, and I've seen this happen in organizations, and it's powerful where it does, is how are organizations expanding their artistic horizons? What are staff reading? Who are they listening to? How are we critiquing work? Are we really checking our own concept of artistic excellence? And what frameworks are we building in so that yes, people can protect their canon, but hold that very gently so that they're not blinkered to new and brilliant work that's coming out, but actually building that in systematically into your work. Uh, data. And um, I mean, there's a real risk with all of the work on diversity and inclusion that it will become just a numbers game and that all we do is measure who showed up to what event and it becomes very reductive very quickly, not particularly meaningful. 
On the flip side of that, we do need to actually check who are we supporting and what audiences are we reaching? And you do that only if you're going to do something really interesting with that data. But what we uncovered in doing this work was that IFAC, the Irish Human Rights and Equality Council have given a very clear ruling on this and said, it is within your right as an organization, as you fulfill your duties around non-discrimination to collect data. And, and then we, off, we offered each of the organizations in Words Ireland tips on how we would do that that's appropriate, that's not extractive for the sake of it, that respects people's confidentiality, et cetera. I think it's gonna be a big one for the sector as we go on. And I'm expecting that the Arts Council is also gonna give good guidance on that. Um, programs with artists and programs with audiences. As I say, within Words Ireland, you've everything from organizations that promote particular genres, but don't work directly with writers or ones that only speak to an international audience through to those that are actually trying to mentor emerging artists from the get go. And so we have a section on programs with artists and programs with audiences. I guess the key point that we're trying to make in our framework is unless you are co-designing with the people that you're hoping will benefit from your work, then it's probably not going to be good, right? So for your programs with artists, are you actually working directly with the communities that you want to reach and the writers that you want to reach in co-designing? Don't make up a project and assume it's gonna work without asking people, is that what they want? And similarly with audiences, our framework checks, have you identified gaps in your audience reach? Do you know who your audience is? Do you know how you want to change that audience? And what are you doing differently uh, in order to attract new and wider audiences? Um, those of you who've worked with me in other spaces will know I do love to bang on about impact measurement, guys. I am a complete bore, um, but I don't think you can do any of this unless you've established some basic impact measurement and say, what is it that we're trying to achieve? What in our work will hopefully get us to that outcome who are we asking as the adjudicators whether that was successful or not? And are we taking time out to think about what worked? And I guess I flagged one fear that I have earlier, which was that this, this flurry of enthusiasm and excitement around diversity inclusion is, is long overdue and very welcome. There is a risk that it will get reductive, it'll be just down to numbers, or there's also a risk I feel that there will just be loads of programs, but people won't take the time to really take a writer-centered approach and then won't take the time to really reflect on the learning um, and everyone will just run that esteem. And I, it's really hard for anyone who's in the not-for-profit sector to have time to consciously think through what you're learning, but I'm really hoping that we will be able to carve out time for that. And then finally, and you'd be glad this is the finally for me, uh, communication. Um, Everything that an organization says, from how it looks on its website to who opens the front door, through to how we tell artist stories, the words that we use, the pictures that we use, how we market artists, how we stand shoulder to shoulder with them when they are on stage and suddenly in the eye of a storm in terms of racial or sexist or ableist abuse, all of that has to be part of our journey. So the last part of our framework is checking our own communication strategies and that we really are being writer-centered from beginning to end. Um, so we set ourselves a relatively high bar. It is like everything else in this project, very early days. I hope it will be superseded by more formal tools from the state. Um, and we're very happy to share that checklist that we developed. Um, and I think by sharing it, we'll learn more. You know, someone will say, you've completely forgotten the area of X, Y, and Z. Um, but I am hopeful that the tools will ameliorate as, as we go on. So that was just to offer a bit of context. And then you'll recall there is the Charter for Inclusion and we're still taking comments on that. Um, but we can return to that at the very end of the session if that's useful. Over and out, Boss Lady Chandrika, I'm done for now. Thank you very much. Uh, it's really useful to see because I, I realise like, a lot of us have seen the I guess, public facing side of, of these initiatives and actually what's happening in the background and one-on-one -on -one with organizations is, is possibly the most impactful. Um, so that's really great to, to, to hear about that. Um, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna um, talk to each of 
the organizations here today. They're going to present very briefly. I might ask them a question or two after their bits, even though they might have uh, possibly already answered my question in their presentations. Um, Afterwards, uh, we have uh, Melanie Ramdarshan Bold, uh, who's a senior lecturer in children's literature and literacies at Glasgow University, who's going to sort of provide a summary and, and feedback about uh, her thoughts on the seminar and the learnings from it. And then I'm going to open the floor for a wee bit, um, depending on time, uh, to take any questions. But yeah, throw them into the chat when, when you think of them, and I will try and wedge them in where I can. So um, I'm going to start with the wonderful team at Skeen Press. Where are you at? Um, Grania and Nidhi, if you are here, um, welcome. Uh, I'd love to hear about all the work you're doing and then probably ask you too many questions after your presentation. So over to you both. Thanks so much, Jessica, for having us. Um, and Towards Ireland for having me as part of the advice group on this project. So I'm going to talk about two new programmatic initiatives from Skeen this year before passing on to Bronya, who will take us through the other key aspects of Skeen's commitment to diversity. The first one is Play It Forward. So Play It Forward is a program that launched um, on Sunday <laughs> at the Dublin Book Festival. And it's a pilot program, which is a joint initiative between Skeen Press and The Singing Fly, funded by the Arts Council of Ireland. And it's focused on resourcing a dynamic and diverse sector by creating opportunities for writers across the board. So in the first phase, um, we're offering creative development for writers, which includes mentoring, workshops, commissions, basically affording time and space for creative pursuits and also giving them some sort of guidance around how to be published. Um, and then in, we hope that in subsequent phases, we hope to use Play It Forward as an umbrella framework, which will sort of expand on creating viable professional opportunities for writers to work within the sector. So there's so many opportunities to work, I think, within literature and publishing in Ireland, whether that's you know editorial or agenting or marketing, publicity, sales, rights, you know, event management. Um, we have, for example, very well qualified, ambitious talent who's graduating out of Irish universities, you know, and maybe they've completed um, writing courses, publishing degrees, arts management courses. And we lose this talent, you know, to other regions, to other sectors, because we are unable to offer them opportunities. So it's important to Skeen Press to create the conditions for a writer to be able to live comfortably as a writer. And we are committed to an operational model that will reflect this by putting writers' needs at the core. And I think we're, we're aware that we won't get this right the first time. Um, but we do hold ourselves accountable and we are implementing quite a rigorous impact assessment and ongoing evaluation on this program to ensure that it will be responsive and dynamic to the needs of um, our fellows coming through. So that's Play It Forward. And then the second initiative uh, that we're going to be launching next year is called the Solstice Series. The Solstice Series is a multidisciplinary platform for experimentation and collaboration. What it will do is it will bring a new writer together with an established writer and we'll have them collaborate on a text together with an artist working in another art form, whether that be visual or performing arts. And then it's produced as a bespoke book alongside a multimedia event production. Um, at least one of the artists who are participating will be from a background that is traditionally underrepresented in the arts in Ireland. So this is one of our projects, again, in which we're looking to mainstream diversity and offer a sort of level platform to all participating artists but simultaneously also working on audience development and reaching out to new readers and different um, audiences so that the, the richness and sort of the diversity of perspective, which I think is crucial to discovering and, and developing talent, you know, and giving a platform to um, amplifying other voices and other stories um, will take place. So that's sort of just a brief overview of, of the programmatic side of what we're doing at Skeen. Um, and I'll pass on to Gronje to talk more about the operational model now. Thanks, Nidhi. Thanks, Shandrika. Yeah, just to build on what Nidhi said there, I suppose, um, listening into some of the previous seminars, I, I suppose there'd be two myths that I'd love to debunk um, from Skeen's experience. And the first one being the writers aren't there. <laughs> um, they are there and we have a very rich and healthy and exciting uh, time in Ireland, I think, to tap into um, 
you know, the richness in diversity in writing that's happening at the moment. And I suppose I really want to highlight that point because that's what Skeen is passionate about is supporting writers to bring out their work in a way that they want. And it's beautiful work and it, it wants to be read by many. And that's the other myth I want to debunk is the audience. There's only seemingly only a certain percentage of the population read books and there are certain this and that. And that's I don't even know where that survey comes from. <laughs> I can never find it. So I really want to say that we've never had a problem selling our books. Um, we've always had to reprint within months. Um, we could sell more if we had resources to to do that. And I suppose, you know, we Ireland, we are, we are we're a community based society. There's networks to tap into for all our audiences. Um, you know, all the books that we've produced have been inspiring and they've inspired different sectors and different networks and different groups, um, as well as true traditional book selling routes. There's a range of other routes that we've tapped into and also to who the writer is speaking to and their community. And I suppose we talk about a writer centered approach and just operationally what that might look like for us and it's evolving as Nidhi said we're learning and growing and learning from writers uh, primarily and um, is we put writers to the center and what that means is what is your vision for your work what way do you want editorial to work what way do you want production to work so we tease all that out and uh, really really completely with people what they can expect from us we have cut off points or time frames or pressures that we have to work on to, but we share that and say, look, how can we work together to, to, to achieve this project in the way that you want? Um, but I suppose what speaks to that too is how we produce the book, you know, from cover through to how it looks um, and then the promotion of it, what an author wants to engage in and what they don't and um, what are interesting audiences for them. Where can we tap into? How can we reach readers? And um, so we do that, you know, within uh, the, the resources we have, um, you know, we do that and we really, really work right. We want to see skiing to be a home for them, somewhere they can develop and move on from for sure, but somewhere that they enjoy working. And we want to have fun and enjoy all working together in this creative process. Um, but what we do also, which it might be useful too, is we have a criteria for decision making that we use more than we think. Sometimes we think, oh my God, we better take out our criteria for decision-making, but we actually do, it's become more integrated in how we talk about things. So um, why we take on projects and, and the financial implications and all that, we work that out with how best that might work for the, for the writer that we're working with in the project. So we put them to the center of the decision-making. And I suppose in saying all of that sounds fine, but then how do you pay the writer? And I think you're know, talking about the ecosystem of books, and publishing, I think that we can safely say the writer fares the worst um, um, in, in the process. I mean, they make pittance um, and that needs to change. And I think what we're trying to do is look at models that we could do better on that. And that's evolving for us, but things like what we're trying to do on a practical level is um, look at how we can give a writer a fee um, that's uncontested, it's theirs to help them and build up their, their project that they're working on. What was brilliant one year, and I say this loudly to the Arts Council, we were able to access a commission grant for an author. And that was for the author. And they could go off and research their book and do work. And they were getting a decent bit of pay for that to meet their needs and what they wanted to do. So they're great. That's a great initiative. I'd love to see pack in for writers to give them something. And then what we've also tried to do, but we, we want this to evolve. And this is something we'd love to do in the sector with other indie presses is look at, you know, the whole standardization of pay for writers and others. But if you're just taking the writer as example in this context, um, you know, we do at the moment, what we do is we say to the writer, look, we are committed to selling say 5,000 copies of your book within this period of time. So we make a commitment. So then we're passionate and we're invested. Um, and then we say, it's all right, look, we sell these copies and we work together and, and how we might do this. And then they get an advance based on that for the retail um, price of the book, not at a discounted rate, actually what the book, book is being charged at out there. So that's one way. So at least the, the writer can get a chunk of money at contract level that they can, you know, it makes it worth their while rather than waiting for drip drab um, sales or discounted. So we try and put that at, at, at that level. Now, no doubt it could be better, but that's something that indie presses could work on standardizing 
these type of things. Um, in relation to contracts, what we try and do now with our contracts is we proof them to the writer's needs. So, for example, um, working with a disabled writer, you know, what are your needs there? What needs to change in this contract that we can proof this for you and make it better? And um, so all those kind of things. But we could bring in standards like that and um, that would make us more accountable and make it more streamlined so it's part of our everyday as opposed to being an add-on so that that was uh, the other point just picking up on Nidhi's and uh, thing we need we need to be diverse that we can't be an add-on and, and what, I, what I was saying at the beginning is we've an untapped resource there is a brilliant social capital in this sector I mean I come from another sector so I've been you know, have experience from the community and voluntary sector, but coming into the public sector, I'm like blown away by all the people that we're meeting and I did with different uh, things to bring. So from arts managers through to writers, through to publish people, publishing, illustration. You know, there's so many people to tap into and that's what we need. We need ideas, we need perspectives, we need all that kind of thinking the whole way through to bring out exciting work, we need that. I don't think anyone would disagree with that. Um, so, but to do that, we need decent jobs. Like we can't do it alone, you know. Um, so in Scheme, we are, you know, we've made things, um, made choices around, um, try, you know, committing to salary levels, committing to each other, committing to who needs to be employed, putting targets in place so that we do have a team that's fit for the job at hand and uh, is passionate about the work but knows has a lens that's appropriate to the projects that we're working on so um, we need to do that but we can't and I think the problem here this is at policy level uh, but we're very happy to contribute as well I'm not just sending a problem back out there and saying oh it's for them but unless the funding very much at the moment is related to it's programmatic so you're you're judged all the time on outputs and books but it's not taking into account what you need to nurture staff to support people to come and work, to be able to offer salaries to people that they can live. So we're losing talent all the time and people are overstretched. So if the funding, if we could look at ourselves as a non precarious let's stop being precarious and let's move into being a, a sector that we can be proud of, that we invest in because we're literature from Ireland is amazing. It's going to be more amazing the more books and the more communities we tap into. And, you know, we sell that abroad all the time. So we should be making it better and we shouldn't be expecting people to work for nothing. It's not realistic and it's not right. So uh, we see that we're trying to carve out jobs at the moment for people to come and work with us from different backgrounds. It's essential to our growth. We cannot do, we cannot be scheme press without that. So that's what we're working on, but we can't, at the, you know, at the moment we're trying to build a budget, trying to build our company to say to people, yeah, now come and work here and let's get on with this together. So they're, they're kind of the main points I wanted to make. Um, and we're trying to put in place practical, um, you know, solutions to that as well. But very happy to contribute post this to try and building a better sector that people can work and live and be proud and work together in and collaborate. Thanks. Thank you so much, Nidhi and Gronia. It feels like you've answered a bunch of my questions already because uh, it's really comprehensive, but I just want to tap into some a phrase that Nidhi mentioned was mainstreaming diversity. And I think that's kind of important because as Nolene said, the initial reaction might be drop a policy, make programs that could actually end up segregating people a bit more, which is great for the leg up approach to you know funnel people in in a way, but the mainstreaming diversity is important in terms of you know, what you are doing in scheme, hiring people from different backgrounds to be in decision-making positions, um, I guess, integrating, uh, creating programs where people, well, writers from different backgrounds are simply part of everyone's stable. They're not kept separate over there in the diverse writers box. They're simply part of everyone's regular programming. And I suppose I think that's a really important part to look at it so that, you know, people might <laughs> not get a, get out jail free card by always pushing writers towards the diverse friendly organizations we want it to be part of everyone's sort of natural programming and way that they're thinking um you did answer actually all my questions i'm not gonna lie you guys and um, but also congratulations on your new uh initiatives oh grania go for it i didn't mention one thing that i think is really important it's about removing barriers right let's get rid of the barriers and and, and welcome people in 
you know, into the sector to work and to, to be creative. But one big barrier, I just really want to flag it because it's coming, going to come up in time and time again against us, for people to work from the migrant community in the arts sector, we've got to do something about the work permit system. And we've got to work together with the Arts Council and to see how we can let creatives work because we're training creatives in Ireland in different courses, or creatives are here for other reasons. And, and so that's the something where I wanted to flag there as another policy thing we should be working on. I'm gonna, I'm gonna shut up now. Thanks very much, Grania. And actually, I'm glad you brought that up. As, as a non-EU person myself, um, it was illegal for me to do any creative work before 2019. Um, so there is a lot, of, a huge amount of barriers for non-EU workers who get trained up in Ireland and if everyone wants to hire uh, diverse staff in decision-making roles, most of us are forced out of the country before we even get that chance. So that is a wider conversation. I just wanna note that um, Susan Lanigan has mentioned some very good points about uh, critics. And actually I will chat about that a little bit later because uh, after the Poetry Ireland bit, because we're, I'm part of a board of diversifying Irish poetry, poetry critics program. So that's all very relevant points and I'll bring them up just then. Um, I'm gonna move on to, uh, so th sorry, thank you very much, Grania Nidhi from Skeen. I'm going to move on to uh, Anna Walsh and James Hudson from the Trans Writers Union and Small Trans Library. Hello, both of you and welcome. Um, so I'm very much looking forward to hearing about the work you're doing, the changes you're making. Oh, hello. Mm. And, um, and I guess the things that are hopefully going to make the sector a safe, comfortable space for trans writers to, to prosper in and the practical implementations of, uh, of, of the work you're doing as well. So very much looking forward to hearing from both of you. That's the road out. Um, oh, also, if everyone who is not speaking could mute, that would be oh, fab. Thank they're you. They're calling it fireys over there. Um, the I the think bulb. I'm going to go first between the two of us. Is that right? Um, okay, excellent. Uh, so I'm speaking, I am one of the co-founders of the Trans Writers just, Union, but I am basically, <laughs> oh, sorry, could I ask? No, that's the right. There's another old house. Yeah, their own old house. Sorry, can I ask, um, I think um, Miss Anna McQuinn, you are an off mute and uh, we can hear you. So please mute, that would be great. Thank you. Um, so I am one of the co-founders of the Trans Writers Union, um, but I am also here to speak on behalf of the Small Trans Library today. Anna will be covering more specifically what we do in the Trans Writers Union, um, as well as kind of a little bit of overlap between the organizations because I am a part of both of them. And Anna also works with the Glasgow branch of the Small Trans Library sometimes. Um, the Small Trans Library has two main functions. Uh, the first is a lending library of LGBT plus books in Ireland. And then the second thing that we do is a mutual aid fund for the community. Uh, I'll be focusing on the book side of things today, but just to underline that the fund is obviously vitally important as I, I think everyone here knows that one of the greatest barriers to writing is just having money. So the work that we do in supporting trans people to like survive and then beyond that to thrive is obviously pretty inextricable from the possibilities for pe for trans people to invest in writing in Ireland. Um, on the book side of things, we have a collection of over 200 LGBT plus books, which we've gathered from donations and also from purchases. We try to kind of keep up um, with, you know, current releases in trans writing to make sure that books like, say, Detransition Baby, the transgender issue, Sarah Shulman books, things that might cut be more costly, especially as they come out in hardcovers, are accessible to trans readers to write, to get involved with kind of current trans literature. Uh, we loan them for free across Ireland. And um, then we have moved towards outdoor events over lockdown um, through necessity, obviously. And we've had extremely successful gatherings out in public over the summer, loaning upwards of 30 books every single time that we meet having around 30 to 50 trans people just coming to meet and discuss books and enjoy company and enjoy literature on the day. Uh, despite not having a permanent brick and mortar building currently, the library is an extremely physical thing. Uh, and I think that's one of the most important kind of facets of the library is that it takes kind of a lot of ideas about 
literature and diversification and getting and like Ronnie said, getting the books into readers' hands. And we take that offline. We we try to do as much as we can in person. We have in-person book clubs, in-person events, we have physical books that people can hold. Um, so that there is kind of a because that you can't understate the the impact of having that physical presence and connection with the literature. Um, especially when there is kind of a lack of uh, LGBT plus spaces in Dublin, um, which leads most trans people to gather online and to miss out in face-to-face -face community building around their like, you know, shared culture and interests. Um, so to be in a room with like a hundred trans books is, you know, it, it's a very rare experience in Ireland and it's been deeply significant for our patrons and to attend cultural events that are organized by a grassroots group and members of your own community. Um, I don't remember who was who said it earlier, but I think it was Nolan in the presentation talking about having the members of the community, the community that you were trying to reach, shaping the programs that you are involved in. Obviously, is hugely significant, and I think there is that is part of why there is such a great response to the library is that there is a difference between having an LGBT catalog in you know Irish libraries and having a library that you know is run by your peers who you can speak to kind of on the same level and who will have a completely different relationship to art and literature than maybe your standard librarian would. Um, because obviously support groups do great work, but to have events which center on art and literature is a huge difference from the, pathology, the pathologization of being trans in Ireland. Like to be able to meet outside of a context of, you know, I'm trans and, I need support and that's why you know I'm going to XYZ uh, LGBT organization in Ireland to be able to meet and say I'm trans and I'm actually here because I want to read a book like that is a, a hugely different thing and so I think the library might seem quite small or even niche I mean it's in the name but we might we might seem kind of niche but the response from our patrons has been like universally positive. Like the, the response is kind of sometimes it floors you because you, it feels like it is such a, a specific thing, but then to see the impact that it has on people um, has been incredible because like we don't just reach self-avowed book people in the way that um, other literature events that I've been involved in do. Like I, I love literary events, but they generally are targeting people who are already interested in literary events. Whereas um, I think we've all encountered, you know, friends who are like, oh, I just don't read. Like, I just, I just haven't read a book since I was like 17. And we meet those people and we reach them and get them back into reading by saying, we actually have this whole collection of books that you might not see in Ireland because there are not really trans writers kind of publishing novels in Ireland. Um, so you might not see this reflected in Irish literature and Irish culture, Irish literary festivals and more, but there is this host of trans literature that is accessible to you. And even if we are still working on getting Irish writers to be able to produce that, there is actually like room for you in literature. And when a trans reader has that, then obviously they have the capacity to become a trans writer in a way that they wouldn't necessarily before. Um, and beyond our own events, we've also had we've had past or upcoming collaborations with the Gaze Film Festival, the Dublin Book Festival, Belong to GCN, and much more. And we've co-organized the thus far extremely successful trans writing mentorship with the Trans Writers Union. Um, and yeah, we're looking to continue in 2022 to just create exciting and engaging and welcoming literary culture in Ireland, because I think. I love, obviously I love the Trans Writers Union. I, I made it, um, I co-founded it, but uh, I just think that these two organizations are kind of inextricable from one another because I personally would not have been able to start the Trans Writers Union with Anna without having the confidence that being involved in the library gave me and kind of knowing that there is a community out there to kind of gather with and discuss literature and culture with. So yeah, I think that's, that's about all that we're we're doing in the small trans library um, to kind of make literature more more fun <laughs> for trans people in Ireland. Um, but yeah, so we're currently working on a trans a, a mentorship program for trans writers. So I'll pass it over to Anna because that is a a collaborative project.
that we are doing with the Trans Writers Union. Hi, my name is Anna Walsh and I'm one of the co-founders as well of the Trans Writers Union. Um, I think it's important to give a little bit of background to the union um, in that it's important to understand the situation for trans people in Ireland and abroad at the moment. Um, we can't access our health care. We're being demonized daily by the national press. Employment and housing are constant battles, as are more everyday things like being, you know, misgendered by colleagues or called names on the street. Um, James and I formed the union in response to specific things such as evident transphobia in Irish literature, the lack of opportunities and support for trans writers, and the like very simple desire to communicate with those facing similar struggles. We wanted to create something rather than remain trapped in fear and anxiety. We wanted to connect with other trans people to do this um, and to figure out a way of engaging in a hostile literary culture while like remain, retaining our dignity and safety. Um, so one of our initial goals of the union was to contact publishers and editors um, and ask them directly if they would work with us to ensure safety and support for trans writers, um, to work on you know, future projects, just to give us a basic bit of support. Um, we've been doing this quite slowly, working with those who respond positively, and we're also keeping a public record of those conversations. This is to combat the silence surrounding transphobic literary players that James and I had previously encountered and that other trans writers and members of the union have also encountered. Um, in the past year, we've also connected trans writers in both a casual and formal sense. We've held feedback sessions, we've accessed bursaries for our members to attend things like writing courses and conferences. Um, we've put several of our members on the stage in festival panels and talks. We've worked individually on panels like this. Um, and this falls all under the vital support, opportunity and mentorship that trans people rarely come across. In the most basic of terms, if a trans person is afraid to encounter someone who has derided their existence in a magazine, that trans person is much less likely to go to a writing event and chat to other writers. We know that networking and mentorship plays as large, if not sometimes larger, a role in forging writing careers than financial backing does. If trans people are blocked from these things at the ground level, or like myself and James have to pay thousands to access them at a university, then trans people will just not be writing or being published in a widely accessible way. The union hopes to shed light on this and embolden trans writers to work with each other, to give mentorship and feedback to each other where possible. This is very difficult, however, as many of us are overextended and underemployed. And this is why, you know, we reached out to Tramp Press, Kit Fryatt, Caroline O'Donoghue and others for our collaborative trans mentorship program. We need to be able to make contact with established authors and presses, and we need for those authors and presses to understand that if they do not help us in this way, our voices will likely continue going unheard. Um, and this is not enough by any measure to counteract the barriers that trans writers face today. We face many structural barriers, part of which is institutional transphobia in the industry we work in. In the past year, we've made several complaints about specific incidents of transphobia within Irish media. And this is work that also must be acknowledged as essential to any real discussion of diversity and inclusion. Literature is an industry like any other, as we all know, and it's an, it's an industry currently benefiting enormously from politicizing and demonizing trans people. As such, it's our responsibility as a union of trans writers to make it clear there is certain, toler certain treatment we just won't tolerate and can't tolerate if we want to keep working. To this end, we've also been boycotting the Irish Times newspaper for three months in response to their pro-conversion therapy article and numerous others that express hostility towards trans people. Again, this is all work that has to happen as trans people cannot feel included if they don't feel safe enough to take part in the literary industry in the first place. Um, and it's also important to acknowledge that trans people cannot do this by themselves. If we are to be actively included in a literary industry, we must also have the active support of our colleagues to this end, the union also works to connect with trusted cis allies as well as other trans writers so as to understand more clearly who we can and cannot work with and go forward with. Um, thank you. That's everything that I wanted to say. Thank you so much, Anna and James. Um, and even I would encourage everyone to have a look at the websites and just see all the resources and all the ways that you could partner or commit. I actually have one uh, question um, because I saw on the Trans Writers Union website, there's this testimonial list, I suppose, uh, where publishers from the UK and Ireland can sign up to say, I, I have committed to working with you. And I'm really interested about the practical side of that because it's very, you know, I suppose easy in a way for someone to say, sure, I commit. And I did notice that some of the comments were, 
you know, trans writers and queer writers are welcome to, to submit. So, but that's not a very proactive approach. So I'd love to hear how you think that could be actually implemented in terms of accountability to like hold those people accountable, but also have there been any publishers or any examples that you think have done it really well so that, you know, a lot of people don't have to reinvent the wheel. We should be looking at who does it well in learning. Um, and especially from your perspective, who, who can say, yep, they were great. We'd love people to emulate that kind of structure. Um, so I think that, first of all, our reasoning for putting up the list um, is to, as I said, combat that silence that surrounds who we can trust and who we cannot. And because we're, we have around 80 members or so, but um, we have a small admin group and, you know, we're all very underemployed and overworked. So we're doing things very, very slowly because we're also very careful um, about the negative attention that we can attract. So we started off thinking, okay, we need to be able to just like cold call people and contact them and get a sense, first of all, of who we think would be receptive of and who would not be because we were afraid that, you know, if you go in all guns blazing saying, hey, do this X, Y, and Z for us, people will be like, we don't know you, you know, why would we want to do this? Um, so an example of some people who have been very supportive of us would be say um, Skiing Press actually, because you know we contacted them and they actually um, supported us in a separate trans anthology, tra trans anthology project that we're doing. Grania helped us with um, advice and with um, contracts and stuff. Um, and to just know that we have someone in that way that we can message and ask very basic questions like that is a huge, like it might seem so small, but again, we're coming from the ground up where we really have to fight for small things like that. Um, and so I would say for people who want to be proactive about being involved, get in touch with us and see what way we can work with you. You know, we don't have any, we're trying to focus on making our members feel safe and good. And we're also trying to, connect them to opportunities and we're trying to also like do our own writing stuff as well we would really love to be able to connect with other people and see how we can meet in the middle and see what we can go forward with you know I, I know that sounds very vague but um I think um like for instance we've been talking with the stinging fly as well and talking about doing workshops in the future that kind of thing is all I think are really good of evidencing that they're interested and want to be doing actual things with us you know i think it's also worth reiterating that um compared to i think some of the other some of the other speakers on the panel um we are a more volunteer force like this is very much not our jobs we are Anna and i are writers <laughs> um first and foremost and this was something that we created out of necessity so a lot of what we do is very hamstringed by the fact that, yeah, it is like one of a million projects that we have, um, like, sorry, that was my dog jumping off the bed, um, between our own writing and then the library and the union and then everything that you have to go through as a trans writer and all the admin of being a writer and also a trans person, like, and that's without even just getting into what everyone does in their day-to-day -day lives. Um, we are very kind of limited and so, one of the things about reaching out to press and publishers is hoping that they will come to us it's not a matter of just kind of being it's not that we are being lazy in any way it's just that there's only so much we can do and we really would hope that that different presses and publishers will reach out to us for opportunities and projects and a lot of presses and publishers across various across the uk and ireland if they've had calls for submissions and stuff have come to us and asked can you share this among your members and that's not nothing like that has been welcome as well because it shows that you have had a level of engagement with the community um in a way that just saying you know like you say an open call saying like trans people are welcome to submit to this it, it is very easy to do that but then to actually show that you you know the community groups that are working in this area um is obviously very different um but yeah i think i think as far as accountability goes it is also a matter of saying if, if a publisher says, you know, I, we love trans people, we'd love to work with trans people, and then later on say, publishes something transphobic, it's, it's that simple. 
that can happen and it is important for us to say you like you showed support to us and we would like to kind of compare these two things for you and see can we like talk through like do you see the contradictions here um luckily we haven't really had to do that thus far um but it is just something kind of to to keep in mind is that we want trans writers to see what publishers are saying about themselves so that if there are negative experiences or things like that that those writers don't feel like they have to kind of squirrel away what they've been through and that they are able to say well this just doesn't match the image that this publisher is seeking to put out but again that that hasn't <laughs> hasn't happened thus far thanks thank god <laughs> Thank you very much, James and Anna. And I just want to say, I uh, urge everyone to, who's in this room or, or listening afterwards to please be proactive about um, standing up against transphobia, but also homophobia, racism, xenophobia, all the phobias, um, and especially now and in a personal and professional and institutional capacity. It's not easy, but we all got to do it and then it'll be easier. Um, I'm going to move on to poetry. Island. So yeah, thank you very much, James and Anna. Um, poetry Ireland, uh, it'll be great to hear from Neve O'Donnell and Elizabeth Mohan to uh, chat about the different initiatives, uh, the different policies, and basically everything that's been going on in Poetry Ireland. Uh, over to you both. Thanks, Chandrika. Um, okay, so um, I'm just going to share my screen because unlike everybody who's spoken before me, I don't and I'm not able to talk off the cuff. I need structure um, to keep my head straight. So apologies to rely very heavily on the presentation. Um, okay, so uh, Pro Ireland is a large and well-resourced organization. I know most of you would know us and our uh, work, but I'm going to just very quickly just intro with we were, Established in uh, 78, um, and our purpose is to champion the cultural, histori historical, and personal importance of connecting people with poetry. Um, we are completely committed to achieving excellence in the reading, writing, and performance of poetry across the island. And we believe in creativity for everyone. So we want to build capacity, content, interest, understanding, and participation. Um, we have three forms of our program. We have education, where we have writers in schools, poetry competitions for children and adults, development education, and, and uh, we run a number of competitions for both emerging, established, and new writers. Um, in our publications, we publish the review three times a year. We have Trumpet, which we publish once a year. We'd really love to do it more often. Um, and then we have an anthology every second year and we distribute um, in Ireland and the UK um, uh, about 900 copies per issue. And then finally, our live literature where we run programs for artists and for audiences with over 90 events per year and we have an artist in residence. So that summarizes us. We're now gonna talk about the approach that Poetry Ireland took to try to really establish and integrate diversity into our program. And when we are talking, when Elizabeth, I'm gonna hand over to her now, this comes with a complete health warning. I hope it doesn't sound like we're going, this is brilliant, we are brilliant, we do everything right, because that is not at all what we're um, going to present. We've made some great grounds in relation to changing how Poetry Ireland works and how it approaches work. Um, but there's obviously always a huge amount to be done and improvements to be made and changes to engage with. So I'm going to pass you over to Elizabeth now. Um, yeah, so in 2017, Poach Ireland embarked on a review and analysis of its activities and policies to assess how we could better support and engage with poets in Ireland from all backgrounds. Um, this process began with seeking feedback from poets from marginalized communities, including poets with various experiences of race, gender, religion, disability, sexual orientation, and socioeconomic background. Um, in response to the feedback provided, we developed a diversity and inclusion action plan and focused on four key areas in an attempt to confront and correct the existing inequities in Irish poetry. Um, this plan did include and does include a number of concrete initiatives, but it has more so provided a framework through which every Poetry Ireland decision is made, um, which I think is something that Shandrika and Steen Press kind of touched on earlier. Um, so our first of these four themes is breaking down barriers. Um, if you wanna slide on there, Neve. Um, so breaking down barriers focused on providing support and amplification for poets from a variety of backgrounds. Um, our main aim is to ensure that across the board, we're providing 
support and amplification, or sorry, providing opportunities that people from a range of backgrounds actually want to be part of, opportunities that are attractive to poets who are writing with a variety of styles, interests, and perspectives. And we want to guarantee those people a welcoming and inclusive space while they're under a roof, whether that's literal or hypothetical. Um, so throughout the year, we offer a number of free and subsidized mentorship and workshop opportunities for poets at all levels, as well as a number of uh, bursaries, commissions, and performance opportunities. Um, so to increase diversity across all our programs, we ensure that our adjudicators and facilitators rotate regularly and that they themselves come from a broad range of perspectives. Um, in line with this, we made the decision to appoint a revolving guest editor of Trumpet, our bite-sized literary pamphlet. Um, so our current editor is Michal McCann. Um, our previous editor is our uh, chair here, Chandrika. Um, so the most vital component of this work, there's a lot to be said about it, but um, is through our partnerships. So I'll leave that to Neve now to just discuss in a little more detail. Yeah, so ultimately um, working collaboratively and in partnership is the only or the best way for Poetry Ireland to actually gain ground and traction. And a huge amount of the valuable work that we do really comes from partnerships. So I've just highlighting three here, which I hope you've all heard of before, but um, diversifying Irish poetry, which is led by Dr. Catherine Gander in um, Maynooth University with um, lead partner uh, Ledbury Poetry Critics in the UK um, and Stinging Fly is also involved. And it's a mentorship program for um, uh, uh, um, sorry, critics um, and reviewers. We also have been partnering and supporting the work of the Working Class Writing Archive. So sorry, the Diversifying Irish Poetry is funded by the Irish Research Council. The uh, Working Class Writing Archive has been funded by the Arts Council. And we're working with Dr. Emma Penny, where a huge amount of work that is just not celebrated on a regular basis from uh, parts of uh, society that have been ignored for decades. So this will be launched on the 26th of November. I really hope that all of you will log on and have a look. And then we've also been running um, in partnership with Kilkenny County Council an empathy building program of activity called Writing Home led by the artist Colm Keegan. And it's kind of designed to give voice to and support the well-being of residents in homeless services. And um, I mean, this is a, a, a program that's been on running or ongoing for about a year and a half. And it's, you know, we've overcome you know, connectivity and kind of uh, uh, issues that people in those services um, kind of come up against that we just wouldn't have been able to do if we hadn't partnered with the service providers and Kilkenny County Council. So I'm sorry, I'm struggling to move us along. Hold on just one moment. So, um, so, uh the next theme in our in our um, strategy was communications and outreach. Um, so in all of our communications, um, we aim to reflect the audiences that we want to work with and engage with. Um, we have a poet in residence who does really important, incredible work with a wide variety of community groups, including Pathways and Fatima. Um, our kind of major, major, major project for 2021 was Poetry Town, which celebrated uh, towns in rural areas around Ireland. Um, each of these towns is appointed a poet laureate, so there were 20 poet laureates overall, and we wanted to really reflect a broad range of writers, both in terms of style and backgrounds and kind of um, where they were along in their writing career. Um, and Poetry Town enabled us to focus on uh, working with a huge variety of new partners, including Pavi Point and Men's Shed. Um, our next theme, uh, leadership. Um, uh, we've been actively seeking to diversify our board. Um, this work and change uh, will continue. Um, in response to our action plan, we developed partnership guidelines which outline our priorities around inclusivity. And before we confirm financial support to an event or partner, we first assess whether adequate efforts have been made to meet those guidelines. Um, we've had a seri some serious kind of governance and policy um, overhaul. Um, for instance, in 2018, we eliminated our unpaid in internship within the organization. Um, moving on now to our final theme was opening doors. Um, so we've taken increased steps as a physical and online space to ensure that people from all backgrounds feel welcome. Um, so our staff following the publication of the action plan undertook disability equality training and more training is, is planned going forward. Um, our original action plan in 2018 did signal our intent to live stream an increased number of our events. 
Um, we had a little bit of trial and error with that. Um, and then COVID-19 obviously just made an immediate pivot across the whole sector. Um, and it's proven to be really revolutionary in providing increased accessibility for people unable to attend in-person events for various reasons, whether that be childcare, disability, or living rurally. Um, so this hybrid program is going to be a real kind of focus of ours going forward, even after COVID no longer necessitates it. Um, at the same time, we understand that the internet also isn't fully accessible to our entire audience. So we've developed some initiatives kind of, you know, in understanding of that. Um, one example is the poetry line um, in which uh, cocooning poetry lovers were connected over the phone with Estona members who gave them a phone poetry reading. Um, in terms of physical access, many of you may have been to our building in 11 Parnell Square East. Um, we'll actually be temporarily moving out in about two weeks, so at the start of December. Um, and when we return and open the building properly in 2023 as Ireland's Poetry Centre, it will have universal access. Um, so that's a kind of just a very quick zip through of our four themes from 2018 to um, 2020. Now it's obviously time for a rehaul of not Totally rehaul of that plan for refreshing of that plan. So Neve's going to talk a bit now about learnings and what our next steps are. Okay, so learnings are huge. Governance and impact measurement are incredibly time consuming and complex, but progress and strategic decisions can't be made without accurate data. Um, the only way to achieve and maintain progress is by intentionally weaving values of inclusion and belonging into every existing activity, policy and plans and targets. And I can't stress enough the number of policies that have had to be reviewed, considered, and it's an ongoing process. It's not like it's done. You know, it's not like we look at something and then we go, we're changing that. This is like, this is the way we should be working. It's a constant review. It isn't sustainable to plan lots of new initiatives. So we have to try to prioritize, um, particularly to try to ensure that we've longevity or sustainability within, uh, uh, within engagement with audiences or certain communities particularly. Uh, we've learned that we're really capable of hurting people even when we're doing our best to, um, or even when we, our intentions are very well-meaning. We don't always get things right and we can inadvertently take people or make people feel tokenized, put them in harm's way and deepen their burden of representation. And this is something that has been a real, like an area that we talk a lot about, about how we change, how we advocate or how we stand with artists. Um, and inevitably we have gotten some things wrong and we are working out, we try to always stay and work out ways to remain open to appropriately reckoning with our mistakes and working out ways to alter or shift inappropriate power in everything that we do. And ultimately the key learning is communication channels, building trust and understanding our key. We've made mistakes where we think people understand us or know how we work and it just isn't true and we need to be clearer. So next steps for us are that um, we're assessing our plan. We're looking at how far we've gotten. We're looking at what's worked and not worked. We're going to recruit a paid diversity council, which will meet twice next year. And with them, they're going to feed into the development of refreshing our diversity action plan for 22 to 25. They'll help and assist on co-designing, planning and implementing, as well as reviewing how we monitor and evaluate new projects and activities help foster change in understanding and attitudes and to strengthen our advocacy. And then impact measurement. Yes, Nolene does talk to me about it every time she, um, we discuss anything and we need more rigorous collection of data um, and um, better filters. And then we're going to continue to seek feedback from our audiences on what we need to do better. And we will endorse and work with Words Arlden on the Charter for Inclusion. And we just wanted to finish on what is a really beautiful quote from the amazing Ivan Boland, which is the margin redefines the center and not the other way around. Um, but the margin has to be visible, it has to be vocal, it has to be sustained by new critiques as well as new poems. So thanks, that is us. Thank you so much, Elizabeth and Neve. Um, that was brilliant. And it, yeah, as Anna Walsh actually is just mentioning in the chat, it's really great to see transparency. Uh, I was going to ask you questions about, uh, you know, the, the challenges, but you've, you've addressed a lot of it about the practical changes like diversifying your board, but also just knowing when you haven't got quite it right, but when making changes to an institution that's been around for a long time, no one says it's easy, 
but it has to be done and mistakes will be made. Um, so thank you for being very transparent about the, the very practical challenges to actually implementing change and how evaluation is a very big part of it. I just want to very briefly mention, just because it got brought up a lot about reviewing, that um, I'm on the advisory board for the Diversifying Irish Poetry um, Critics Programme. Um, and yeah, that's kind of something that we're, that, I mean, the programme is, was is led by Catherine Gander and Manuth, but the structure comes from Ledbury Critics Program in the UK. It exists already, and it is a lot about shifting those power dynamics from the reviewers, the people in decision making roles who actually, you know, can talk about other people's work and not just work by other diverse poets or writers, um, and kind of putting them into those positions and and I guess widening the pool of reviewers in publications all, all over Ireland to address those imbalances, but also, frankly, to raise the quality overall, you know, um, because their insights will, I think, raise the quality of any publication. And hopefully non-diverse writers will go, well, that's a good level. I should probably be writing like that. <laughs> um, so I'm going to move on quickly to our wonderful last presentation speaker, Sasha De Boyle from Kirch. Uh, Sasha, I know, joined uh, the organization straight into lockdown, uh, led the festival into, I think, one of the first like proper online festivals at the time. It was like in April or May, I think. Um, and it'd be great to hear all about Kirch, um, the way that the program has evolved and changed and done a great job, I think, in the last while and any of the... Um, programs and initiatives and challenges that you have faced. Over to you, Sasha. Hello. <clears throat> Hi, everyone. Uh, just bear with me one second while I uh, share my screen and make some magic happen <laughs> with a PowerPoint presentation. Uh, okay. Can you see my slides? Is that good? Uh, okay. So, uh, Again, uh, thank you for, for having me here today. Um, I think you're all probably uh, familiar with Kurch uh, as a festival, um, but you know, just in case you're not, uh, it's one of Europe's oldest book festivals and a leading voice for literature, both internationally and across Ireland. It brings readers and writers together to tell stories, to share new perspectives and to celebrate writing books and reading in all forms. Um, I, I'm gonna talk a little bit about what we've done in the past, but I'm not gonna focus too much on our online programs from the last few years because I feel like um, <laughs> I feel like we talked about it a lot and so I'd really like to talk about where we're going. Um, so the big question for me uh, when I started in this role and I wanted to get curious about was how can we as a festival meaningfully support change in the sector um, when I arrived in, it felt like there wasn't a lot going on. And even in the last two years, the sector has really responded, actually, and developed uh, significantly in its approaches to access and inclusion, which is wonderful and a really interesting context uh, in which to begin working. Uh, but yeah, my, my kind of thought was, you know, when change is being called for from governments, from funders and from our legislation about diversity and inclusion, what role does a festival specifically have to play? Um, that was something that I was very interested um you know and also how can our time and resources be used uh, best to support these changes um how can we think differently about our approaches um you know we're a small festival and we didn't want to duplicate any activity that was already going on by resource organizations who were really you know serving the needs of people new programs that, that um were coming from organizations that have better expertise in specific areas um so for us uh the first thing to do was to really uh internally at least, I mean, uh, and also externally in how we talk about it, but reframe the challenge of inclusion. Um, I think a lot of people think of it as something that, you know, needs to happen. And of course it's essential work, but as if it's a chore or something bad, when actually it's hugely exciting. Um, so for us, it's a real, uh, yeah, it's a real opportunity. It's a chance to discover brilliant new artists and to support Irish writing to glow, grow and flourish, which is, you know, one of our, our core uh, missions. Uh, we also wanted to approach everything from the point of view of our values um, and as a festival of course it's been around for a long time since 1985 but they haven't spent that much time reflecting on on their, their core purpose or, or what what informed that decision making that direction so we spent some time considering our values that would underpin the festival and uh, allowed them to kind of guide our approach as we move forward um, and then the next thing was just to be specific and to be aware of our limits. So we are a very small organization 
I think, you know, the festival has this really strong international and historic reputation, uh, but we have, we have the most amount of staff we've ever had currently, and we have two and a half people. Um, so it's not, it's not a lot, um, and we work with a small budget. So what we want to do is, is make sure that the work that we do um, is resourced properly, that we're taking the time to do it properly, but also um, to be aware that, you know, our, ch our change is going to be incremental and it's going gonna, it's gonna to take time. Um, so what we've done uh, in that approach is really, we, we haven't had the time or the resource to look at it from a really, really big picture. So instead we've taken it on a case by case basis, because I think, you know, I, I, I'm a big fan of policy and, and doing things properly and having the structures in place to inform the work. But often if you're a small organization and you don't have the time to create a huge EHRD policy or action plan, that means that you might never get started. Um, and so you're just gonna sit there being like, well, you know, when we do that study or when we finally get that money for that consultation or when we eventually do that. And so that's why I really like Nolene's point about having a checklist or a bit of a framework at the start of projects, because what it means is you're just stopping to take a moment and be like, what barriers are in place in this project? Is there anything we can do that's easy now that we can change? Um, and those small active changes is kind of where we've been focusing uh, for the time being. Um, and then another area was uh, thinking about our partnerships. So something that I noticed in terms of, uh, you know, improving the diversity and inclusion uh, and access uh, to our festival when I came in was just that a lot of the partnerships that we had were limiting the amount that we could do in that area. And so seeking out partners that really shared our values and that wanted to work on projects uh, with us uh, was really important. And we've done a good bit of work on that. I'm really excited about it. And then, uh, yeah, something about the process. As I mentioned, you know, we're still learning and we're very small. So uh, we know that we'll make mistakes and it feels like we've been kind of protected from the real time impact of that mistakes because of everything being online for, <laughs> for the last two years. So we're really keen to get out into the community and to see audiences in person and get feedback from them to hear, you know, how our programs are speaking to them, what they would like to see change. Um, and then uh, as we take that in, you know, we'll be able to learn and develop uh, for us as well, uh, evaluation is really, really important, and I'll go into that in a little bit. Um, but that kind of that wider consultation uh, and making sure that we have a diversity of voices inputting in what we do it is also important too. But again, within the context of being small, it's like how do we do that uh, in a way that that doesn't take up all of our time because because we just are physically limited. It's, it's not possible for us to do that all the time. So what we do is we have an advisory group. That represents the stakeholders and the audiences that we want to reach um, and they're involved in our decision making in our new projects and then we're also currently developing our ehrd policy finally <laughs> um, at the other end of doing a bunch of work um, and that's with francesca lamorgia and the advisory group and that will look to the future and what it will do is really kind of codify the actions that we have been taking uh, into a plan so that we can be held accountable to them and then also so that uh, in the future uh, for handover and legacy that a new festival team will be able to take that on. Uh, just a quick uh, mention of a couple of proje projects and things that we've done over the past few years that we you know, think have been working well. So uh, first off we partnered with the National Library of Ireland to do the Irish Queer Archives first ever poet in residence, uh, Sean, who is here somewhere. Um, and that's been a real success and wonder, a wonderful way to kind of open up the archive and to make clear that that resource is available for everyone because anyone can access the archive. And we're currently discussing with them how that project can grow, uh, which is lovely. Uh, we were lucky enough to partner with English Pen on their centenary celebrations last year and to uh, use that to uh, commission a new writer, Swad Al Zara, specifically from the Middle East and North African region of the world uh, to be involved in our festival last year. And so we, uh, we kind of wove uh, her work throughout the program and that was such a lovely way to, to do that um, mainstreaming diversity piece that Nidhi mentioned uh, so well just to, to ensure that she really was involved at the points of the festival it would be so valuable for her so as she was involved in our opening night event last year she was also in our new writing showcase and she also featured on our digital delegate program as a debut writer being showcased to international festival directors so it was about different points that would have the most impact for an emerging writer. Um, in terms of our program development and uh, our moderator development, those are two areas where we just have thought hard about the roles of power and gatekeeping in the sector, and then also who's given a platform. So um, I hope that our program spoke for itself last year, but it was very important for us that we both uh, showed a diverse range of voices from around the world, but also a diverse range of voices from around Ireland. And so uh, if you're taking the, the criteria of the equalities legislation, 
uh, as a guide, I think around 40% of our writers last year came from those backgrounds and 17.5% of them came from, uh, came from Ireland specifically. Uh, so we're showing diversity both abroad and closer to home woven throughout the programme, which is very important to us. And we also took the time to create opportunities for new moderators from diverse backgrounds, which I think is a really, really important one, because the person who holds the keys to that conversation when you're in a literature event has a huge impact on how that work is viewed, uh, how it's taken in, kind of similar to reviewing culture and things that we've been talking, uh, we've been talking about here today, actually. Um, and they can also uh, add a really wonderful lens of, you know, shared experience or shared background to a conversation that you would miss out on um, if you had a, a moderator from a different background. Uh, we did some work with just, you know, uh, existing projects. So Kirchner Reading Prize, we tried to subsidize entries and that was very successful. Our winner actually, I think, was, was one so, uh, for last year. So it's just lovely to see. Um, we trial to say what you can ticketing and we're really keen to see how that will work in the real world um, next year. Uh, we also trialed access on um, options. So of course, our online programs from the last two years, but also trialing ISL in events, trialing captions, just to see how, how we could make those work, how much they cost and how we can roll them into the festival on an ongoing basis. And then um, everyone's talked about, you know, evaluation, data collection and impact is being really important. And I, I just feel that they are yeah, absolutely crucial and often the thing that gets forgotten, forgotten and it's, it's really sad. <laughs> so for us, uh, it is emergent, but we've put structures in place to collect equal opportunities data on the artists that we work with, but then also with our audiences. Um, of course, has not had the greatest track record of historically collection evaluation data. So we have data sets from 2020 and 2021. Um, and then we also have some data from 2016 from a fall to Ireland survey. And between those, we can start to piece together a picture of, of uh, how our audience is changing. They weren't collecting any data on artists in 2016, um, but it has it, it has already shown dividends. Um, so, you know, we've already seen um, our audience ages 25 to 34 uh, go from 19.8% to 27.3%. We've seen a growth from 2% to 6.4 in audiences from Black and minority ethnic backgrounds, and a raise from 6% to 13.3% in our audiences identifying as deaf and disabled. Um, and that's just just the beginning for us. The challenge for us in 2022 will be seeing how that translates to audiences in person, because that is something that I haven't had an opportunity to do yet. And it's been a, it, it's been challenging to not see that. Um, and so we don't have that baseline there to grow from. So we'll be using next year as a bit of a baseline in terms of that and then growing from there and seeing how we can make sure that this audience that we are starting to develop comes with us into venues as well and feels welcome there, too. Just going to spend a, a really brief amount of time talking about this new project that we're working on, which I am so excited about. <laughs> so it's called Breaking Ground Ireland, and it is a landmark project celebrating uh, 80 writers and illustrators from ethnic minority backgrounds, including Irish traveller writers from the island of Ireland. Uh, it has yet to be announced, which is you're all hearing about it first. <laughs> so uh, an announcement should be coming in the next uh, couple of weeks, putting on our funder, which is also to be announced, hence them not being mentioned. <laughs> um, but it, it kind of uh, directly tackles what Grani was talking about in her first presentation, that conception that the writers aren't there, because the thing that I've been made aware of since coming home to Ireland after living in Scotland for 15 years is that the writers are there <laughs> and they're all brilliant. And so a chance to really uh, showcase uh, and celebrate the breadth and the depth of, of diverse Irish writing today uh, is, is something that we would love to do. And to say that, you know, they're not just writing in areas that are directly linked to say, for example, memoir writing about, you know, one's trauma or one's migrant status, but they're writing across genres and at a really high level. Um, uh, breaking, uh, sorry, going through my notes. Um, visibility is a really, really important step on the path to building a career as a writer. And we hope that the project will provide meaningful opportunities for writers who have not benefited from traditional platforms and to support change and growth in Ireland's literature sector. A key outcome of the project is going to be a booklet, which will be available in print and digital format, showcasing, showcasing writers at every stage of their career from emerging and early career to established voices. And the booklet will raise the profile of these writers and, and be a, a valuable resource for the sector. Uh, the booklet will be distributed to organizations around Ireland, including publishers, editors, festival of arts organizations and local authorities, and will launch at Courage Festival in, uh, in 2022, taking place from the 6th to the 10th of April. 
just to say a little bit about our partners on this project. Um, the project is run in collaboration with uh, NUIG here in Galway and Speaking Volumes. And Speaking Volumes are an incredible organization. And the people that I first had a conversation with when I took that question, um, you know, what can we do as a festival to support this change? What, what, is, what is most useful for us to do? Uh, they're a UK-based literature organization specializing in getting underrepresented voices heard, reaching diverse audiences and finding exciting ways to present the work of writers. Breaking Ground Ireland is a continuation of their existing Breaking Ground series, which you may have seen before. I would really recommend checking out their website, speakingvolumes.org.uk. Um, and since its inception, Breaking Ground has supported the careers of hundreds of British writers and illustrators of colour, including writers such as Roger Robinson, Bernadine Avristo, Patience of Gag, Ag, Ag Bobby, um, and uh, many of them will have had their first uh, exposure and kind of you know lifting up of their work through this uh, and have since gone on to have incredibly successful careers. Uh, in terms of how the uh, process will run, we're going to have an open call, which will be followed by a panel of review. Um, and it will be, as I said, open to writers at any stage of their career um, who are from or residing in the Republic of Ireland or Northern Ireland. Uh, there's no uh, requirement to be a citizen. Uh, your, your migrant status, also immigration status, is not relevant, which is great. Uh, and yeah, we will be including writers from ethnic minority backgrounds in Ireland and those from Irish traveller backgrounds. Uh, and writers will just have to demonstrate a commitment to the creation and sharing of their work. We're also currently planning some follow on phases of development for the project um, with other partners, which will be announced in due course. Uh, so, yeah, that is that's basically us. Um, I hope that uh, I hope that that was useful. It was a bit of a whistle stop tour and uh, going full screen has completely hidden my clock. So I don't know how long it took, um, but I hope that was useful. And I am really excited to share more about this project once we're able to announce formally, uh, hopefully in the coming weeks. Thank you, guys. Thank you so much, Sasha. Um, so to say we're coming a little close to time, so I'm just going to say we're going to go a few minutes over so we don't rush the last speakers. Um, and instead of my question, I'm just going to I'm actually just going to put to you Susan Lanigan's question, who's in the chat, um, basically about problematic authors <laughs> who might be part of festivals. So sometimes exclusionary actions and hurt caused to marginalized people are caused by authors or literary people behaving badly. Have you ever had the problem of having an author invited to an event in Kirch and they're guilty of this? Um, basically, how, how, how does one manage that? That is a really, really tough one. Yeah. And it's something that I think about all the time. I've seen it uh, played out in action at a couple of festivals uh, in recent months, actually, and just thought, wow, that's something that it's, it's hard to track. You know, um, what you can do is, uh, I mean, I, I try to, to invite writers that I, you know, have shown a kind of commitment to being respectful of, of all people um, and, uh, you know, are committed to be, you know, being inclusive and showing that through their words and actions, but it is hard because you know you don't know you don't know how a person is until until they are in your space and and there you know if, especially if they don't have a strong online presence, it's really hard to track what they might be like in person. So it, it is definitely a challenge. Um, for us in particular, um, you know, since I've been in this role, we haven't had any in person events. <laughs> We've had some writers come to Galway for events, but the having people in a physical space interacting with each other that may, you know, for example, one might be from a marginalized background and, and one not, uh, we haven't come up against that yet. So it's something that I am I'm keen to avoid. Uh, and I would be really keen to hear any feedback from, from other people on how they might have managed that. But at the moment, it's not it's not come up for us yet. Thanks so much, Sasha. I have way more questions, but we would be here all day if I asked all the questions I had for all the organizations. Um, so just, just to note, I'm probably going to let us go about seven, ten minutes over time, just so that we don't rush everyone. If you've got to go, by all means do, because this is recorded, so you can always tune back in later, but I'd say maximum ten minutes over time. Um, so thank you so much to all of our wonderful speakers. I just want to flag that our wonderful Sarah Bannon, who's head of literature in Arts Council, just wanted to um, say a few small words and respond to a few things. So Sarah, if you are about. Yeah, um, I'm here. I'm here, so I won't, I won't take up much time, but there were just a couple of things that came up that I just thought I could even clarify kind of things that are happening or on the tracks, but just to say that was like a really inspiring hour and a half. So it was really great to hear all of that work. And I feel um, quite inadequate now um, after hearing of all the amazing projects. Um, on, on Susan's question, I, I just would say like from the Arts Council's perspective, 
this kind of issue comes up a lot. And I think for festivals in particular, there is that tension of kind of balancing like the the uh, policies and having formal policies and all organizations should have complaints policies and they should all have those formal channels while retaining what it is that people love about festivals, which is the informal and all of that. So I think that is a tension that people find hard. That was just, that's my two cents on that. Um, just, just to say I'm with the Arts Council. Um, you know that we're all guided by a strategy, which is making great art work. It's a 10 year strategy, which finishes up in 2025. Um, we have an equality, human rights and diversity policy. We have just appointed um, a new head of diversity or our first head of diversity or equality um, diversity and inclusion, Dr. Saha Shafar, who couldn't be here today, but I think she's going to come to one of the later sessions as well. Um, so she's only just started um, in, in, in this past month. It's great to have her on board. We also have a, another corporate policy, which I think goes hand in glove with the with the EDI policy, which is the paying the artist policy. And what I thought was really interesting about the Words Ireland research um, was that while it may have gone out looking only at the issues of EDI, the issues of pay kind of came up and the, the two went really uh, closely together. So just, I, I'm, I'm very interested in, in Skeen's approach and how they were talking about those kind of different models and how they're paying artists. Because I certainly think that in the Arts Council, we think this is a, we think this is a big issue and we're really interested in um, getting particularly the publishing uh, publishers to maybe look at um, when the Arts Council funded, look at stepping away from that kind of um, commercial publishing model and saying, just because that was the model that has been in place in commercial publishing for many years doesn't mean it's the model that we all need to follow um, until the until the end of time. So we're really interested in looking at those and, and supporting different approaches. Um, the Arts Council's policy in relation to literature is aligned um, with our overarching making great artwork policy. But one of the uh, policy approaches that we've taken in relation to publishing and festivals over the past number of years um, ties into what I think Gronya might have said about expanding horizons. And I suppose we've been trying to fund more journals, more outlets, more projects, more festivals. And that is a departure from previous Arts Council's approaches in literature, where it would have been like, well, we can probably really only afford to fund two or three publishers and maybe one journal well, and we'll just do one big festival and that will be enough. Um, and, and actually we're taking a different approach, but I will say one of the, I don't know that it's an unforeseen consequence, but a consequence of that is that the sector itself is very tall and very, you know, but it is very skinny um, and, and perhaps um, malnourished. So I think the other point that, um, um, and, and I suppose when I, when I talk to the council, I do say that I think literature is, is perhaps underpowered in terms of, you know, in terms of its potential. And I think there's the paying the artist piece, but then there's also paying the, the sector. And I think, um, Gron, you made a really interesting point there around the jobs in relation to um, literature and publishing and how there is a big focus from funders. And I think that's probably referring to us on the activity and the programs and all of that. And the myth is that the, those, our myth in the Arts Council is that those artistic activities um, can happen without people behind them. And actually, um, so we are looking at that kind of issue. And I suppose just to say that in the, in the literature team, in, in any case, we're very conscious of that and know that core costs are indeed like core and they are they, they need to be important we've always want to balance the two things and I think again you know uh, Neve talked about this and in the Arts Council we're, we're constantly trying to make improvements and I, I would say every time we make one step forward realize oh god the unforeseen consequence of this is is that so um, in previous administrations of the Arts Council the worry was that core costs had gotten too high and artists weren't getting enough um, weren't getting enough money and so then you know the pendulum swings the other way but there's there's a balance that can be struck, I believe. Um, so just within the Arts Council, as I say, we have our EDI policy and we are in the implementation phase of that. It is both inward looking and outward looking. Um, the outward looking part is really um, great because it's, it's responding to all the, orga the organizations and individuals like yourselves. And um, they've been really good. Like all the initiatives that have, that have been surfaced today, um, we've been really happy to support and I suppose um, that's that's been really wonderful. I think of the Arts Council's own systems. I think everyone here would, would agree, um, try as we might to try to make these more open and make all of our materials more open and accessible. There's still a journey for the Arts Council to take to make those processes more accessible while all the time balancing that openness and accessibility with our requirements as a public funder and all the bureaucracy that goes, goes with that. So, um, I was saying to someone recently, I'm conscious this is recorded, but getting the Arts Council to move is kind of like moving a tank. 
Um, and so it just, we, we move very incrementally and it doesn't move quite as quickly um, as perhaps people would like it to. And, and just like Neve was saying, um, I, I suppose we've been doing a lot in terms of um, collecting data around the artists that we're supporting and the organizations that we're supporting. And we're just starting to build up a picture of that. And just like the others who've come before the Arts Council, we've made plenty of mistakes along the way and we're trying to learn from those as we, as we go along. Um, on a really practical point, there's just a couple of um, things I wanted to say. We'll be running next year, strategic funding, arts grant funding. Those are the kind of the pillars of organizational funding. Commissions I heard were mentioned a couple of times. We are running that in literature again next year. Um, so we didn't run it this year because it was at the, if people remember it was at the very end of 2020. So it will be run again for 2022 in the kind of the first part of the year. Um, we'll be running another literature project award. We will be running the capacity building scheme again. And I, I know a lot of organizations did use that and uh, to, to kind of build up their capacities in terms of, of diversity and inclusion. We're running bursaries again, we'll be running Next Generation again, we'll be running the Markovich Award again, and we will again be running the Agility Award, which has been a really um, good way of supporting a lot of new artists who maybe hadn't come to the Arts Council before in a more light touch way. We're also heading into a new strategic planning process in terms of just our, the, 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 our big plan, making great artwork is 10 years, and then it breaks down into kind of bite-sized plans. So we're working on a new three-year plan. And obviously that is gonna, be informed by the fact, you know, COVID, our EDI policy, paying the artists, these are all new since we did our last plan. The, you know, the prospect of the universal basic income coming in for artists, um, and then the Arts Council's own funding base having radically shifted over this period. So those things are all going to be informing the way that we that we work, but that's all um, on the cards for next year. But just to say, it's been a real privilege to listen to all the um, programs here today and thank you for letting us sit in and in, in here and it's really I suppose it's just really energizing for my, my colleague Audrey is here from the Arts Council as well and I think it's really energizing for myself and Audrey to get to hear the great work that you're doing and it gives me um gives me a real uh, lot of confidence and again kind of puts it up to us in the Arts Council to make sure that we're doing that we're doing better to match the great work that's happening out in the sector. Thank you so much, Sarah, and thank you for taking the time to, to respond to a lot of the things that were coming up in this and uh, saying a few words. Melanie, you, I'm so sorry that you're right at the end now, but you have heard a lot today. Um, so just to introduce Melanie to everyone. Melanie Ramdarshan Bold is a senior lecturer in children's literature and literacies at Glasgow University. Previously, she was on, she was associate professor of, of publishing and book culture for six years. She's currently working on several projects that explore issues of diversity in quotation marks, which is my favorite way to put it as well, and inclusivity in children's and YA publishing. So, um, Yes, Melanie, if you want to say a few words. Of course, and it's really difficult to, to follow all that and to summarise everything because I think everyone summarised it really neatly. Um, I'm always very, very wary when I get invited to reflect and talk about issues of diversity, EDI, um, because I've been in so many rooms. And I think, um, you know, James, I thought you put it really well when you were talking about being a socially mar marginalized person, talking about issues of diversity and how exhausting that can be, especially when you have, you know, many, many other hats on. Um, and I've been in so many rooms as a, the only brown person in the room with publishers and uh, cultural organizations, et cetera, where, you know, I've heard some awful problematic things. Um, and I think my my issue with EDI has always been that, you know, are our, our creative, are our, our the creative and cultural industries actually engaging with characters, authors, readers, and other creative and cultural professionals from socially marginalized groups, you know, in a are they dealing with them in a superficial way because this is a pressing issue now? Um so I was really, really quite heartened to be in this conversation where it does sound like, you know, the organizations here are addressing inequalities in cultural output and, and professional practice in quite a critical way. Um, you know, in being more critical of practices and really questioning your own intentions, attitudes and beliefs, etc. So I just want to say thank you to everyone for for sharing what you're doing in such an honest and transparent way, because I think it is. And I think it was Neve that said this. It's an ongoing process and it is always going to be an ongoing process. It's not something that anyone can find any solutions to at the moment It is going to be something that is, you know, that we're going to work in until um, you know, it is mainstreamed and it is part of embedded in absolutely everything that, that we do. Um, 
I just wanted to say a couple of things. Um, I think it was James again who was talking about the safety of, of authors and cultural, you know, professionals. And I, I'm sort of trying to uh, follow the, the sort of conversation, the chat in as well, which relates to safety as well. And I think it, that is really important is providing these protected spaces, not safe space, because I don't think there's a, ever anything such, I don't think there are safe spaces for socially marginalized people, but how do we create these protective spaces for socially marginalized groups in the cultural uh, industries? And um, it's, you know, all these initiatives are really, really great. And it, it is important to get more people um, into these spaces, but how do we actually ensure that these spaces are protective, uh, protected and people feel safe? Um, and uh, Nolene, I, I know that you mentioned uh, embedding that sort of self-care into the programs that you do. Uh, and I think that's, you know, that is both allowing people the time and space to experiment, which some of you are, are doing, um, but also, you know, pr making sure that you're not being hypocritical, but like, critical you know that your 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 practices if you know if you're a publisher you're not publishing transphobic material and and also tr trying to make spaces for um trans authors as well and that's accountability so I think having that level of accountability that uh, I think quite a lot of the organizations we're talking about um into what you're doing and being held into account as well um the other so I'm 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 conscious of the time we've got like one minute so I'm conscious of uh, saying this I think the position that you're in in Ireland and I think Scotland is in the same position is that we are really fortunate that we're, it's really really easy to make these connections and networks and form this community of practice I think it's really exciting that you're all here together today and sharing your best practices and I think with anything with any sort of social activism because you know this is this is this is an activist movement it, it, it will only work if we work collaboratively and I think you've you know you've you've all talked about your partnerships um not just within Ireland but outside as well I think you've all, all already talked about your partnerships and I've delighted that you've added universities as, and academics as your partners as well because we are all part of this process um and I really liked what people were saying about co-designing with um, members of the community shaping programs as well I think that's an important aspect um and it's 40 so I'm just going to end very quickly on data I do think ongoing data connection uh, collection is really important and of course I'd say that because I'm a researcher um, but I think it should go far beyond the numbers and I, I do collect numbers I do a lot of quantitative research so I understand how important that is to um, to sort of evaluate your practices over a long a long period of time and to hold people accountable but EDI is also very much a human uh, pro problem um, and Sasha, I did love how you sort of reframed it as it's not a problem, it's an opportunity and exciting. And I do very much believe that, but it is also a problem. You know, it's something that we do need to tackle. So I think thinking about how you can integrate sort of qualitative research as well, um, as you know, that's as important as sort of metrics and impact and KPI as well. And um, I realized that I have... Uh, uh, gone over to I you know I could speak about this for a long time and I think it's really exciting hearing what everyone's doing today um, and I'm more than happy to speak to people on an individual basis after this but I do realize I'm taking a lot of time as well as well but um, no I was just really really pleased to hear some of the sort of really critical engagement and the critical work that you're doing and um, so yes exciting Thank you so much, Melanie. And yeah, I, I wish we could all just sit and hear all of that and then us more information about, you know, where you are as well. Um, but I would, you know, encourage everyone to look each other up. That is my favorite parts of, of the Irish artistic community is everyone <laughs> hunting each other down and having coffees and having those conversations and creating new partnerships is the best part. Um, over Zoom, it's, that's been one of the challenges. So please do look each other up and see how to work with each other uh, and support each other. Thank you so much, everyone. Um, thank you, Nidhi, Grania, um, Anna, James, Elizabeth, Neve, Sasha, uh, Sarah and Melanie. And thank you so much to Words Ireland, to Nolene Hardigan and Brendan Kevley and Ruth Hegarty, who've been organizing this. Um, Brendan put in the chat and I'm just gonna put it again. Oh no, I didn't, I didn't photocop not photocopy it, oh my God, copy paste it. But if you scroll up, Brendan has put the link to the next webinar. Uh, you can sign up to it the same way, oh, there it is, the same way that you have signed up to this one. Um, thank you so much for, for spending your morning with us. And this is recorded if you wanna send it on to anyone else or watch back. Um, thank you so much, have a, have a good one. <laughs>